Hello, welcome to the Futures of Mixtape. I'm Jesse. This is Matt. And we're going to go picking flowers on this one. And avoiding the weeds. And we're going to talk about films, but it's not going to be Goonies. My kids saw that. I did my dad moment and we watched Goonies. My kids now love the 1980s. Things seem so much better then. I mean... <laughs> in the 80s? The homes were nicer. The people looked what? well better fed were they? in the were, right ways. Were they? But we'll talk about a different film. We're going to talk about... Uh, uh, Michael Moore's uh, illustrious Where to Invade Next, which we both agree is is a central masterpiece. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, it's probably his best work to date. Mm-hmm. And we're going to take a long <laughs> trip Dump. Along, with, along with him <laughs> through all of these mm-hmm. ideas that he... But it's all about turning into rabbits. We'll talk more about that. <laughs> and, and shitting out of the cage of the rabbit cage. And, getting, uh, getting out of the exactly. cage to shit in the woods. Exactly. And so this is a podcast about solutions and michael moore's film will offer solutions right so we're going to look at those for this podcast and at least open the door to thinking about some sensible ideas many, using those rabbit fingers to get out of that cage how many fingers do they have a little, mm. little paw to I'll count that shit get the key and <laughs> see it all there so <laughs> all right enjoy thanks When I started doing teacher training practice back in the U.S., I I was in these certain neighborhoods teaching these kids and telling them, you can be anything you want to be when you grow up. This is kind of a lie. And when I came to Finland, a lot of my teaching is based on what the kids want and what they see for their future. So it it doesn't feel so false to say you can really be whatever you want to be when you grow up because they're making it happen already. They already have such power. (laughs) That's upsetting to think about that, Hmm. that our kids don't have that. Hmm. The, The film itself, Where to Invade Next, is kind of based on the premise that he wants to pick the flowers, not the weeds. So there's a their opening line in the first parts of the documentary where he says, sure, Italy has its problems like all countries, but my mission is to pick the flowers, not the weeds. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, something people missed out when they were reviewing or talking about the film is that he's purposely not talking about the complex, the nuanced problems yeah. that exist. He's saying, look, let's take a highlighter pen and see what works, where the flowers are. Yeah, and, and I agree that this is his strongest uh, film that he's made, and in large part that's because all the previous work is conventional sort of, oh, isn't this horrible? Look, yes. look at, look uh, slack-jawed at this horrible thing that's happening, and let's get outraged about it. And and even and the most famous uh, and the most successful and, and profitable film, Fahrenheit 9-11, was really focused where there was already a lot of energy and disgust around George W. Bush and um, the starting of the, getting us into the Iraq I war. I think it was responsible for making the election closer than it otherwise would be, but a lot of people thought that would actually um, push the election towards John Kerry. Sure, sure enough, but I, I think this is where... As and this seems to be perhaps this is and we hope this is a a mm-hmm. cultural mindset shift that's happening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If we see obviously what we're trying to do here, if we see things like Naomi Klein's newest book, which we haven't read yet, but at least from the description and the premise of it is you know no is not enough, mm-hmm. and moving mm-hmm. towards oh we got to talk about solutions and look mm-hmm. to solutions. We can't just like be up in arms about how how horrible the world is and. And uh, yeah, I mean, his, his time, documentaries so. kind of have that uh, terminal dystopia syndrome. Exactly, the TDS, moving, moving the circle, away from, trapped mm-hmm. in the circle of complaining, right? And actually, you know, po- poking at the system. And I think Michael Albert, the anarchist uh, economist and uh, thinker uh, in social struggles, had said, you know, you if you if you took a table and you made a stack of people diagramming the epistemic tragedy of capitalism, it would fucking <laughs> go yeah. past Mars. Yeah. But if you actually looked at recent solutions. documents about solutions, it'd be you. You'd be lucky to hit the ceiling of your own room. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I think that's 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 why this is so precious so, as a film. And, yeah, and, and regardless of the effectiveness and reach and uh, details there therein, which we'll, that's what we want to move on to here. Like 
it's respectable that that's what he's trying to do. Like, bravo for turning the lens towards solutions. Mm-hmm. So what he does, the framework of the film, is he visits nine countries, eight of which are European, one North African country, and tries to pick the flowers. He's like, all right, instead of going in to invade all these countries to try to take their oil and to... Let's just go and I'll just look go the, and look, look at, at the, the good ideas. Look at the flowers. Take, I mean, it's it's back. it's so incredibly stupefying that no one's made a documentary like this. And what's also, I mean, I think I always jokingly say, I wish Michael, I wish, I wish um, Woody Allen would do a film once every three years rather than every year because he's stuck on that pattern. Mm-hmm. But Michael Moore took six year six years to do this film. Well, so a six-year break, a, but yeah, I think but, he. I think once he started, it happened pretty quickly. But he's just I, he was doing other things. But but I, but I think the idea is that he wasn't trying to just shove out another film. Right, right, right. That, yeah, that, yeah. Through a six-year process, he arrived. Yeah, he was doing, doing it this. secretly with a small group, doing a lot of research. But it gave him a kind of meditative distance from his other films. Mm-hmm. And this is a major break in his his oeuvre because it's the first one where he's explicitly. Number one, not framing politics around electoral components. Mm-hmm. Like it's not just Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, yeah, and yeah. kind of yeah. partisan hackery. This is the, the real first film where he's not thinking in terms of electoral politics or cults of personality. No, it's like what he's I, looking what, at policies. Yeah, what I what nakedly ideas, and openly. Yeah, what ideas, what policies are better than what we we have in place in the yeah. US fuck, that we are fuck politics we are. what what works so yeah, yeah. this film is organized and orientated around the politics of effectiveness mm-hmm. like what is the efficacious aspects of th- this country in terms of what they do well mm-hmm. and so the irony and paradox is these, of course the film's called where to invade next which is once again him using juxtaposition and irony yeah, yeah. and you know putting a flag in, in yeah. various countries. <laughs> he I'm saying him, we're plants it, he plants the American flag at But each we one, yeah. steal ideas, not people or lives. Mm-hmm, and I think mm-hmm. that's that's a powerful metaphor. Is America just works from wars on metaphor. So I think what I would like to do here is like just go through and talk about each of the ideas that he's mm-hmm. trying to that he suggests that we steal from these countries. Mm-hmm. Um more I, more than Instead of like debating the yeah the aesthetic ends, value of yeah. the film because I I would say we both think this is his best film yeah so uh, easy there we go and, Let's and move sick on it was the, the best one but but I, I do want to reference the point that that this is this is a type of political formation and technique as well as strategy that the left should think about which is stop playing to electoral politics yeah. Talk about policy and ideas and we're seeing that this is an opening where well, we can achieve things because Jeremy Corbyn's um, tour was him holding the manifesto in Britain, mm-hmm. saying, "Forget about me. Let's fall in love with ideas. Yeah, let's let's work on Help our vi- in, well. Let's work on our vision for our world. Yeah. So what what, are, what do we what do we want? What do we want our world to look like? Number one, what are our values? What is what is a beautiful life for us and our community? And then think about the policies." of what's the most effective to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what's so brilliant strategically is this is an emotional film, it's an uplifting film, and it's an uplifting film that simultaneously makes you angry and full of rage. It's like, why don't we, why <laughs> why don't don't we, we have this yeah, policy? Yeah. I don't even care about the country. And yeah. uh, he literally looks at the policy outcomes. He doesn't explicitly mention uh, this political party did this or this political party did that. He looks at about how values met activism, how activism has transformed electoral politics mm-hmm. in terms of implementing policy. I think the most explicit he gets in terms of talking about electoral change is when he talks about, um, you know, later in with Tunisia, and we'll get to that. But, but I think I just want to really highlight before we move on and document the ideas is that this is a, a very successful way of making an argument. Don't talk about the labels. Organize on ideas and effectiveness. Well, and I don't know, I don't recall the use of the word policy mm. in the vocabulary oh, of the film he, at all. He doesn't really, use too, policy. So, yeah, you're right. right. So that's, that's he another use policy. important thing to put in here, I think, is that it's not even talking in the framework of that as the debate. It's just about what is your life like? He, he takes those whispers that left or liberals or even conservatives have at a kitchen table or a dining room at a barbecue they're saying, wouldn't it be nice if we had this? It happens, and, and he takes all these 
mysterious whispering things that even in the left, like this country has this program or that program, but it's, he puts them all together in this film. Mm -hmm. So it's not these kind of whispered solutions. He mm -hmm. says like, well, what if we just brought all of these things together mm -hmm. um, and stop talking about it in whispers at this, the kitchen sink? Right. Let's, let's let's put these on. Let's write these down and, let, and talk about in them. In blood, <laughs> in blood, or feces, ape feces. Yeah, I mean, literally. I mean, you couldn't get more um, direct in terms of announcing the ideas than he does. So just go through these in order. Sort of? Yeah, let's okay, go. So let's go he, through he, the the nine countries for, or ten. It's nine. So for the first part of the film, the first section is. Uh, visit to Italy. Mm -hmm. And the idea here is about uh, rest and relaxation or paid vacation. So we talked to a, a couple about how much paid vacation they have and visits uh, a couple companies, um, Ducati and also a the motorcycle company and also a fashion design a fashion design house which one was it or, i want to say armani oh, no 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 well they make they make clothes for it's, a, it's is, an italian the, famous the famous lardini italian. company yeah i think what's i mean what's interesting about the nation states that he looks at is each of these ideas are themed around not just topics but also things that you would want right. like values so so here in the U so here in the us there's no law that uh, guarantees vacation Time. So this this Pay, meaning paid leave. There's no there's no law to guarantee paid leave. Mm -hmm. But to be a member of the European European Union, each country has to um, sign up for the mandated four weeks of paid vacation, paid leave, twenty days a year. Of so this is the first country as well as chapter one on Italy. And I, I in my notes I called it R and R rest mm -hmm. and relaxation because mm -hmm. he literally looks at the notion of rest and relaxation. Mm -hmm. And he looks at that in a more pluralist sense. He just doesn't obsess about vacation. He talks about lunch breaks. So a two-hour lunch break is kind of the, the way things function. Right. Talks to the talks to the couple and they have like six or seven weeks uh, a year. Of, of they paid say leave. up to eight weeks va pay, mm -hmm. uh, vacation paid or otherwise. Because fifteen days paid if you get married, so you can go on a honeymoon. Yeah, it's honeymoons <laughs> built in. Onto the vacation, yeah. you know, it's guaranteed. So, what, what what do you think about this? Well, I is think this, it's this, I think it's absolutely fucking remarkable idea we're stealing. I mean, the other thing is like, so, I mean, I think by looking at Ducati and fashion line, fashion design company, he's looking at companies that um, don't treat their workers as kind of edifice or something a detritus. They they're 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 constructive of the society, and there's a general common sense respect to the values of a society. Like one of the sisters of the fashion design company said like, why would you have a worker that's not happy? Right. And that mm -hmm. it affects the clothing that we're making. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, one of the representatives are owners of Ducati, the automotive company in Italy that does very high end, you know, designer, you know, motorcycles and those sorts of things. He said, there's no clash, clash between profit of the company and the well being of the people. It seems a little too simplistic and sentimental and maybe not completely sincere, but the fact that you actually would have a yeah. spokesperson say that openly mm -hmm. is kind of remarkable in itself is that, that it's acknowledged as such. And I mean, he says that, you know, Italy has one of the highest life expectancies in the world. They live four years longer than, than a, an average American, you know, four weeks paid vacation. And one of the, the funniest things in there is they tell him this couple, right? Mm -hmm. This couple, this couple tells them that most Italians wish they could live in America. And then he, then he tells them that there's zero guaranteed leave. And they're like, what the? for part time or yeah. anything. It's, just, yeah. it's based on the union and the company itself. Yeah. And, and they were shocked. So they're shocked. So, so this tells you why we get so much immigration and refugees in the U S is because we have the best advertising in the world. We don't have the best <laughs> right. outcomes in the world. America has the best fucking you just, advertising. You just shout your number These one. These are Italian folks, right, that think that America, like everyone else, is the greatest place to live. And when he tells them these kinds of fact-based things, that number one, there's no guaranteed vacation. Number two, there is no two-hour lunch break. Number three, <laughs> they don't, we don't get a 13th paycheck in the yearly cycle. I mean, what blew my mind, and I didn't even know this, right. is that there's a 13th month in Italy where you <laughs> get a not paycheck. Not 13th month. But December, it, but, you get an, an but, extra, yeah. But it's, yeah. I'm using this an, yeah. explicitly as a 13th month, as if there is 13 months. I'm not saying there's 13 months in the year, but it is a 13-month pay cycle mm -hmm. where you get an extra month of pay on the, the time that you're taking your vacation. Mm -hmm. Because 
you can't take a vacation. You don't have any money. Yeah. You know, there's lots of people that have vacation. They end up having a staycation. So I, I'm raising my hand Woo. for that for that one. So, mm, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, like I write that on feces. <laughs> put that on the wall. Oh, fuck. No. <coughs> oh, oh, some of my feces got in your mouth. I'm sorry <laughs> about that. Apologize. That's some deep shit. Yeah. So your hands are up. My, hand, like my hand is up. Hey, you I got go, do you need a pee break? Okay, that's <laughs> no, fine. No, I need to say. I need to try now. I'm not. Okay, just, no, no, it's just near your thigh. Okay. So I have hand, something to say. Okay, go ahead. Something to say. Okay, I'm excited. <laughs> are you? Yeah. <laughs> Look excited. Mm. Sound excited. Mm-hmm. Excited for a vacation. Yeah, I would like that. How, mu- how much vacation do you get a year? Like, well, do you get you know, thir- 30 I mean, days he talks like about, in Italy? He talks about how do you, you, you guys don't have a second and third vacation, right? And, you know, I'm in a second and third job. And uh, because my wife and I raise kids and we have no one else helping to raise them, I have to work extra, teach extra classes beyond what I normally teach um, at another college, um, once again, to pay the bills. And so, yeah, I would love vacation, but it often includes using that time to make more money because of the way that society is structured in America where you can't really live near your family and your health care is tied to your job. And so I think the, the, I, the notion that paid vacation is not even granted in the United States for part-time workers is obscene because most a lot of people have part-time jobs. And that means they never get to take vacation. So they're even more exhausted than, than full-time workers. That wasn't the question. Question was about your how much do you accrue? What do you what do you get? Well, I mean, it, so hypothetically, employment. I have my summers off, but I usually do a summer session. So I generally I have by all standards great vacation, even though I'm overworked. I have most of December off, and then I have about two two and a half months off you work in the summer. To the, you work to the academic year. Yeah, I, I work on an academic cycle, and I I became a teacher not just because of stability wait, of but pay, you, wait, you, but be, to have more vacation. But are you paid monthly? Through, oh yeah, through that through that whole time period. Oh, absolutely, period? absolutely. Okay. So you're, I'm paid, I'm paid even when I'm not working, which is great, right? And you, oh, I always know there's a paycheck down the cycle because I'm a contract tenured uh, uh, lecturer at UC Riverside. So I already know that I have money coming every month. It's just it's kind of built into being a lecturer and being tenured. But what's really amazing is to get a paycheck during the month when you're not working or the two months that you're not working. And so I, I explicitly picked teaching. Because I, my, when my dad lost his job, it was really shocking to me, and I wanted stability, but I also wanted vacation. I knew that vacation was more important than money. Well, you, you explicitly chose teaching, but you also pursued it through mm-hmm. the necessary struggles to arrive oh, at this yeah. point. It no, wasn't no, just like, oh, it, it wasn't like it. I just it's not easy. It's not necessarily. You, know? you have to. It wasn't through. handed to me, but you know, once again, that's a whole other argument. I was saying. I'm saying we should have a side where everything's handed to you. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm not trying to celebrate the struggle, but yeah, there was a struggle. I had yeah. a 35 hours a week working at Chuck E. Cheese and going to community college and then saving up money. And, I mean, even and, after your PhD to get to this point, like, oh, of course, everybody has to, does. Oh, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I mean, teenage I mean, jobs, but. I mean, we'll get to that later. But in Germany, they get off at two o'clock, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, there, there's still things that follow me even when I finish teaching, which is grading and emails. So. I would say, you know, I do get more vacation than most Americans. So I, I work, I, I have a more of a much normal, yes. much more of a normal 95. job. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a teacher, so I don't get the luxury of the... Giant block. The giant blocks of time off, although I, that's probably what I should be doing. Initially was going to pursue, but, you know... That was, I was life. encouraging you to at some point. Oh, on, no, on, any, was, on any level of education, K through 12 or college... Is, because of the giant blocks of time that this, you get, yeah, this is what no was, other occupation gives you those giant blocks of time. Right. Yeah, this is what I was going to do to earn a living in my life, but uh, I'm a complete failure, so that didn't happen. So I I'm, still love you. I'm, 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 you smell sweeter as a failure. I mm-hmm. so I'm I'm stuck in a normal nine to five type. How job. many weeks of paid vacation I, do you I, have? I, we so I get like currently I crew like a day in. A, Order or something per month, which mm-hmm. so ends up being like two and a half weeks. Oh, it's about awful. For, and this is UC per, so. per year. But that's so there's that plus the handful of paid holidays, um, you know, university holidays. Yeah, well, national holidays. So when the campus shuts down in December, do you are you still working or what's December like for you if you're so at the university the when UCLA. The, the university shuts down for actually closes for like a week or something like that. It fluctuates and those folks who don't have uh, leave time have to like take leave without pay. 
the <sighs> university shut down. Yeah. yeah, I mean that we've talked about education in our pro- a prior episode, but I mean the main thing is like it's it's it's, it's abysmal that that uh, the vacation's not spreading in an egalitarian fashion to the campus. But at this point, okay, more rest and relaxation is good overall, yes. good for good indivi- individuals, good mm-hmm. for the collective uh, society as mm-hmm. a whole, that one, we, we are unnecessarily overworked, mm-hmm. mostly in bullshit jobs. That <laughs> David Graeber jokingly says 10% of the U.S. economy is dealing with overwork. Is, it, is, yeah, yeah. Ten no, percent, ten percent of the jobs and the like, ten percent of the energy in the economy and the like is just is about worker, work exhaustion. It's just coping with the bullshit jobs that exist. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. The psychological <laughs> trauma of bullshit jobs, yeah, yeah. and and also just generally overwork. Working, you know, the the hours of work have gone up in the United States, not gone down. And John Maynard Keynes had said um, with uh, something he co-wrote with his co-wrote with his son. That you know he's writing this in the 1930s, late 30s, is that you know by 2000 we'd be working 15 hours a week. That's not happened, and we, I mean, Americans work more hours than they did in the 1950s. I want to get back. We'll get back to this later in oh, yeah. in the episodes because we revisit the Golden Square and those four ideas mm-hmm. of the essential human rights, food, shelter, healthcare, and education. The- that our work should be organized around that, and so much of <clears throat> around making sure like. Majority of the work should go towards like making sure that those things happen. Like, well, we should all be spending absolutely. time on that. The golden square. Is so much of everything that we do, mm-hmm. people people are running around well, and, acting and, like they're busy all the time. And when we go to work, central to that is when do we not work? I mean, that's that should be like the primary organizational form of the discussion of work is like when and how are we not going to work, mm-hmm. right? Because it's already oppressive to work, mm-hmm. and I, I'm not going to make some jolly assumption. That labor is meaningful and work is meaningful for most people. Most people hate their jobs, even at the same time mm-hmm. that studies indicate that they think work is important for self esteem and identity and purpose. We are very paradoxical in our feelings about work. So, I mean, what's good about Italy and the idea of to carry through is making rest and relaxation, R and R, central to the premise of just going to show up to work. Mm-hmm. You know, that when you go to work, yeah. that, that's already a given. The other, the other thing from uh, Italy, the section on Italy here is about uh, paid maternity mm-hmm. leave mm-hmm. and that Italian mothers get five months of paid maternity leave. That's, m- that's mandatory. That impressed me because I so. typically thought those policies, that those deep policies were mostly in the Nordic countries. So I was impressed that even mm-hmm. Italy had that policy. Yeah, You know, in, in Sweden had a about two or three years ago, started a poster campaign to get uh, uh, husbands to stay home with their child and extending that time. Yeah, it's just, it's absolutely horrendous what here in the States folks have to do. The Germans call us robots. I actually, when I was in Europe, they just, they jokingly call us the robots. That's actually like a little German joke is Uh that they they actually refer to Americans as the robots. And that of course has a lot of bad connotations beyond just um, work, <laughs> yeah. also notions of conformity. Yeah, um, you know. So, and I think the great moment in the Italian sections when he talks to one of the workers at the Ducati automotive industry, and they have this nice spread of food, and the cafeteria is gorgeous. And he says that look, we got these things through working class struggles. Yeah, you know, these didn't happen through magic. No, they they the people and were imprisoned can, and tortured. To yeah. People were imprisoned and tortured for these worker rights that yeah. are profoundly deeper than the United States. I, I think most of uh, all of these ideas, all of these flowers picked through the film mm-hmm. were mm-hmm. arrived at through mm-hmm. struggle mm-hmm. and for through collective action. Co- collective continuous yes. struggle. Yeah. And, not, con- and, and, and are continually not holding a fucking sign with pussy hats <laughs> on it. You know, it, it, it took continuous social struggle yeah. and a path to power where demands were made mm-hmm. at the areas where they're needed most. Yeah, yeah. so then the, the next uh, section is on in, takes place in France, and mm-hmm. he's... he's, he's <laughs> I, I didn't he's expect pretty, this. I mean, I didn't expect to see he, you, because pre- it seems trivial on the surface. It seems kind of trivial, but he's pretty gobsmacked about the quality of the school lunches in, in France, and... Mm-hmm. Uh, how the the youngsters at the school that he visited were drinking water, mm-hmm. and there was no soda, <laughs> they, there they was no drink, tea, they it didn't was drink, water. They didn't drink Coca Cola, but it was water in a beautiful pitcher. I mean, what I loved is about even though it's water, it's got to look fucking nice, you know, uh-huh. like at the table, and the, the way the children were treated at the tables, like that the food comes to them. I mean, there's something so epistemically gorgeous about the values of food in France, where 
you sit down and the food arrives to you because mm-hmm. it's a sacred moment mm-hmm. with your community. I mean, the, the kids were, it looked like a little restaurant when you're in there and it, they, they, they had the white chef outfits, the, yeah. the food was all yeah. laid out. Nothing was preserved or altered or modified. Um, you look at the menu and it just makes you cry, right? Mm-hmm. And, and there's a funny scene where he shows pictures of the food that students had sent Michael Moore, uh, and he shows us the kids, and they're like, what? "It's from oh. America, from yeah, U.S. Yeah, food from America, yeah. yeah." And and you know that that in itself is hysterical and tragic. And I think while this seemingly is so trivial, I mean, food. What's more important than what you serve children? That is food. Mm-hmm. So on the surface, it seems like well, and and especially mm-hmm. for. K twelve for for young kids to treat it as a class. Yes, right. They, yeah, we talked about that too about treating the, it's a full hour and it's not just about getting the necessary calories to mm-hmm. so you don't collapse, right? Which is mostly what <laughs> yeah. U.S. Uh, we, school we, lunch. I, stuff well, I is. think in general Americans treat food like an input service, like right. you're just putting in data, mm-hmm. and it's not actually about an artistic, emotional, spiritual connection with others. They're a collective. Yeah, and thing, you got yeah. the sense that, you know, there, there, there's a water, of, a beautiful pitcher of water, beautiful plates, right? Mm-hmm. They're, they're not like Tupperware. They're not pieces of plastic that are shoved in your face. Mm-hmm. This actual cutlery, metal, mm-hmm. you know, ceramic fucking plates. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's that amazing scene where you actually see this child offered Coca-Cola by Michael Moore, and she drinks it, and she's like, "Oh my god, I just like just peed in my face. This is gross." And she so she looks at him with actual horror and disgust because she's you never had Coca Cola, yeah, yeah. I guess, in her life or yeah. something. Uh, and that tells you something about the fact that um, that children just don't drink that shit. Where Michael Moore probably does. Yeah. You know? oh, no, he does. <laughs> he, yeah, he's yeah. a yeah big fan. Yeah, um, I, literally a big do. fan yeah. uh, of, <laughs> of 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 it. So I think mm-hmm. th- it's a great idea. Quality school lunches and the big payoff, of course is that at the very end of this clip, he says, okay, I'm picking sh- absurd flowers. Well, wait, wait, stop. Let's go to the this poorest is, school. This is the poorest school in, in the, you know, one of the po- in most um, you know, um, diverse areas of France. Mm-hmm. And this is their food, mm-hmm. right? That, yeah. the, 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 that I'm, in the, I'm in the socioeconomic gutter and this is the way they're treated. And it's, still, and, you know, it's still better than care, any, yeah, quality better than food the, at a private school in mm-hmm. New York, right? Yeah. And, all, all, all for less. And guaranteed, Costing less. guaranteed why? Through the government of France, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's a mandate. They've created a state mandate where we kind of just leave it up to the states in the U.S. because the government spends so much money on war. Yeah. So beyond beyond the the high quality school lunches in in K twelve system, daycare, free daycare, college being nearly nearly free, and only paying. You know, all this comes through. Taxation, well, and, right? you know, and so there's all there's this like specter of ta- taxes, and so we, we here we think that like oh we're gonna have to like spend so much. This is gonna, again the whole argument we talked about. We spend so much, I and mean, this is what you know the uh, chef Monioc actually says he spends less per lunch than mm-hmm. we do in the U.S. That's mm-hmm. a shocking statistic because we think we're getting more for less or less for more, but mm-hmm. like th- what they have they use well. Yeah, but they they get all of these things uh, for you know slightly more. Slightly increased taxation, and I think I I liked I really that liked, graph was like amazing. The, yeah, and I really the graph liked, of yeah, France versus the U.S. And I really like the point where they talk about the detailing on a pay stub of where ta- where taxes go, which is something we've never I've never seen here. But mm. Where your where the taxes go from your paycheck, the detail. Yeah, the fact that f- that they actually show what amount of your taxes go. To different sectors of the yeah. economy, so we know sixty percent of ours go to fund the military, yes, and industrial it, complex. But how here. many Americans know that? Because I don't. I would say maybe fifty well, percent. Yeah, I, mean, I would say fifty percent of the country doesn't even know the consumer-based nutrition facts of their taxes. I mean, it's basically impressive is that they they outline every aspect of what's being spent mm-hmm. as almost like consumer nutrition facts on the back of mm-hmm. a product. But the the argument the argument here is that. Look, they have all of these these things that may, make life more bearable and enjoyable and higher quality education and healthcare and mm-hmm. and everything. But they only they only pay slightly more in taxes than we do. 
we actually we we pay less because we defer them to individuals. Well, and and, and so we have to t- we actually end up having to pay for these astronomically more. We're paying because, more. I think if you look we, at payroll taxes and you pay state income and sales taxes, it's more than what they're paying. Right, but we end up paying more in the long run because we pay tuition for mm-hmm. college, mm-hmm. and then we pay for health care, and then mm-hmm. we pay for nursing homes, and it just. All to get in the long run, we pay so much mm-hmm. more. For and all it's so things. as good as the graph is that Michael Moore sets up at the end of the French section, it, there's stuff that it's we're just, mentioning that's I even think outside it's of that. An important bit of, and applicable to most of these cases, is an important bit of logic about the efficacy of public uh, financing mm-hmm. for these things. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Um, you know, if the, mar- collectively. If, if the markets have failed miserably to provide these as guaranteed rights, then we have to look at other means of doing that, even if even if it's disgustingly something from the state. And this is this is used all over the place. The power of the collective, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. the power of the collective is here is like uh, is looked down upon, thought as mm-hmm. evil, thought as a looked uh, upon as a threat when it's about us, when it's about mm-hmm. people, and when it's mm-hmm. about the working class. But this is how capital works. Yes. <laughs> like, it demands from us the way we have to demand from it. I mean, you know, uh, capitalism doesn't do things by hugging you. But if we want social change, we have to be also coercive back and demanding back. And, and I think this is the important thing is that, once again, in key moments in the film, Michael Moore says, this didn't happen out of thin air. This happened through social struggle, mm-hmm. class conflict, mm-hmm. naming your enemies. You have to name your enemies. Yep. The other idea here in France to to steal is uh, sex ed. <laughs> Duh. He shows a funny video clip of uh, a chlamydia outbreak in America in, in Texas. Yeah, in and Texas, a clip of Rick Perry talking, uh, trying to trying to defend abstin- abstinence, which was being taught in in Texas. Oh, and, and there's a big study that came out three years ago that says it's a bona fide failure. I mean, oh yeah, uh, abstinence education is a denial of actually the psychology of kids and to kids do risk taking when they're teenagers and yeah. that includes sex. So so the implication in the film is that oh they do all of the sex ed in, in France and uh, they actually talk about it in a lower human, rates of teenage pregnancy and lower and rates U- of yeah. STIs or STDs. By, by, by far. Like the US has five times as many teen pregnancies as, as France. So and sexually transmitted diseases yeah. and you know so it runs the course and I, I think once again the French know that sex is an essential part of human life mm-hmm. and they don't try just to like avoid food. it just like food and it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's going to happen. Kids are going to fuck. Mm-hmm. It's going to be real and <laughs> it, let's have it real mm-hmm. with condoms and real with birth control and real with sex ed. Yeah. And I, I love the way the teacher talked about sex, right? That when they talk about sex, it's not about all the bad things that are going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's all the beautiful and joyous aspects of sex. So when they even teach sex, it's done holistically. It's not like uh, you're 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 going to turn into zombies. It's yeah. like this is a beautiful, essential part of our children's of our teenagers' lives, and we should expect to I, show the good parts of that. I feel like not only like all of these cultural markers and and evidence and and mm-hmm. and texts that we might reference and talk about, but even in my own experience, life is just here. In the states is just this maze of electric fences. Yes, like yes all yeah, of yeah. this you just can't touch. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you can't touch, can't think, can't see. It's like electric fences that you can't see through, right? Yeah. I mean, it really is a maze. And nothing that um, you'd ever ask Daedalus to kind of go through or you know touch. You know, it, and and <laughs> you know, Icarus doesn't even have to touch the sun. <laughs> you get electrocuted in the fucking maze before you get anywhere out of the Minotaur land. And so I think you're right that. That the fact that th- there's such a comprehensive view on sex was also stunning. That it wasn't just this disease wheel. I mean, I remember being in elementary, it was like, okay, don't do it. Here's all the fucking diseases you'll get. And it was like right after DARE, right? Another yeah. failed program, like yeah. uh, of, of just assuming that somehow negative, cautionary, you know, punishment based warning systems will work well no, for kids. I mean, what also strikes me about. I mean, about this piece overall and about a lot of these ideas is that it's just uh, how much of it's cultural, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. This Again, it's this puritanical imposition uh, in, in the culture that we, the, we live the, with. The irony the, the of these States. places have longer histories of Christianity and sexual shame than the United States. Mm-hmm. So, so you almost feel like, you know, 
the U.S. is just like removed from some of these secular forms of thinking and free thinking. And so these are countries that were far more religious and conservative than the U.S. in some ways at some point, Mm -hmm. but have battled out of that kind of narrow-minded thinking. Right. And then next... The third country, the third chapter of his documentaries, Finland. The... (laughs) Where's the... Uh, reportedly the best uh, education system in the world. Mm-hmm. While, it, while, it trades <laughs> places, in fairness, it trades places with South Korea, you know, every other year in terms of the number one slot. But the problem... Because of the Philippines, too? Uh, yeah, maybe. I, I, I don't remember if, where Philippines is in the ranking. But I think the irony, of course, is this, this the way that rankings are even done, it doesn't ask about the well-being being or psychology of the students. So, yeah, South Korea can beat Finland... But what is the cost? Like right. high, huge rates of suicide, cram schools, really frustrated and angry kids that aren't really that psychologically developed and that they'll hide and wear diapers downstairs and in weird internet guru place to play League of Nations. So, you know... Um, League of Legends. League of Legends, yeah. So, so the outcome of Korea, even when it does best Finland, they have much, much less uh, satisfactory students in those in, in institutional regimes. So Finland does better, not just on scores, but just, you know, as a, what children are like. I mean, wouldn't you surprise how the Finnish students seem better than American adults in terms of their self-awareness? <laughs> they just seem like more self-aware than the average American. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the through line in all of this is just recognizing our humanness, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. Uh, recognizing that there's more to life than making a dollar. Well, I think, you know, what was fascinating about this is you get the sense that the Finnish system, of course, it's it's publicly financed, it's heavily funded, but they don't spend that much more than the U.S. does on education. Once again, the argument is that, okay, they use a lot of money to get these results, but the budget in Finland is about remarkably the same, except they put more money into teacher wages than in stu- and then mm-hmm. teaching testing regimes yeah. and testing companies. Yeah. The, the story here is that through the 60s and 70s, like, Finland and the U.S. tended to be around the same rankings, mm-hmm. down lower, around 30 or some, something. U.S. is currently uh, 29, apparently, somewhere around there. They used to be around, hovering around the same area in terms of the quality of the mm-hmm. education until they decided to make some changes. And mm-hmm. that's what they talk about is really just like letting children be children, mm-hmm. like not using standardized testing, yeah. not having a ton of homework, so mm-hmm. homework is fairly non-existent, especially for, for younger kids. Uh, letting kids be kids, mm-hmm. in short. And worrying about primarily their happiness mm-hmm. and their potential to create the lives for themselves that they want. As to Educating be, towards to that. To live a good life yeah. and to be a good human. I mean, there's a moment where Michael Moore is talking to a math teacher and he sounds like he's a fucking philosopher. I mean, yeah. like he's a spiritual guru to kids. <laughs> and and that he that he narrates and thinks about the notion of of what makes a good child is not just that they have data in them like their computers. In the US, it seems like our educational model is to treat children as computers. That we put a series of come, data, come, answer yeah. questions, you know, you know, this is the kind of well, ridiculous thing. Yeah, the the thing here is indoctrination. Mm-hmm. Uh, conformity and conformity are paramount, right? And and that these aren't Those, even these are the goals. These aren't even good economic measures for the future because we won't need that kind of human being in the future. We'll need creative, yeah, no. inductive, deductive thinking, out of the box, creative. Well, if we, adaptation, not not necessarily. If the future we're moving towards is the exterminist future, yeah, bring back the mm-hmm. for futures potential future is. No, we really don't need humans at all. So, well, it's just, I, you know, I'm of course referencing yeah. what we want. I mean, not, yeah. Yeah, I'm not talking about the four futures, but but like what we w- should value and actually make center of this. And one of the the big thinkers, probably the most important thinker uh, on Finnish education system, is uh, uh, a gentleman by the name of Pazi Solberg, and he says something really smart, which is in the U.S. When we do testing, mm-hmm. we test 100 percent of the students across the country. Mm-hmm. And he used this metaphor with an American who's like, well, why don't you guys do 100%? And he says, like, look, if you have to find out that you have a blood disorder, do we have to take 100% of the blood out of your body? We take 10% or less than 10%. Yeah, yeah. And so in, in sample, Finland... You take a sample. You take a sample. And in Finland, you do the 10%. So they only test 10% of the Finnish student population, which gives the creativity back to the teachers. 
mm-hmm. and allows for the assessments to take place, but not use huge amounts of money. Right. This is the money in politics thing, is these testing in- industries make a lot of money through these testing regimes, so where the, the money that would go for teacher training, mm-hmm. uh, teacher pay mm-hmm. for retention and recruitment, uh, smaller class sizes, are, is increasingly going towards teach the test and spend a shitload of money for yeah, Common Core. The bureaucracy involved oh, in common the core. standardized Well, the, you know, yeah. the insulting thing about Common Core is that these are the things that you need to know, and it's all going to come from above, and it's not going to be and, rooted in the community that you live in. And you don't need to know art and philosophy and poetry, mm-hmm. but mostly don't need to know any of the, the humanities. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think here. what's really impressive is the way this one of the teachers says in the documentary is that we assume that there's this this hard boundary between uh, school and life, but that if we give children play, they can bring their experiential, experimental play time and bring that into the classroom. So like a kid's up in a tree and talks about an insect, he'll bring yeah. that up into conversation yeah. naturally when it yes. happens. Yeah. And so that you need breaks, right? Mm-hmm. To no- enjoy education, even in the rigors of testing or coursework or homework, that it's better to have a separation. Uh, and I see this with my son, who's at a um, a school that's you know that's you know kind of STEM related, and you know he's d- doing homework in a kindergarten, and he fights it, he hates it. Um, and how, how much homework? He d- he has he had homework every day. My son London had homework every day because you know it's part of something called an AVID program, which is like college preparedness. Or schools for for five years exactly. For, you know, get them ready for you know. Yeah, this whole thing is like all about college. Is the answer we'll solve it in college somehow. And and <laughs> what's and, called, what's called, and this avid yeah. program is is uh, usually you know diverse, underrepresented populations, uh, i.e., exploited populations, poor populations, areas that don't have historically high scores. And so what they do, they solve that by giving them more more homework. And so the high performing schools. They don't have the homework for kindergarten students, but the kids that are, are behind in the scores, they get extra homework, which actually like defeats the purpose. <laughs> so my son, you know, fights us like yeah. every day on homework yeah, yeah. because he shouldn't be doing homework in kindergarten. It's yeah. fucking insane. Well, the other the other point here is that there's virtually no private schools in Finland, apparently. Mm-hmm. Yes. And virtually none. Virtually none. And so all of the public schools, you know, all of the rich kids have to go to the public schools. So there's a incentive for those more well-off families to make sure that oh, the schools are good. Oh, my God. And, and then there has to be the diversity of the socioeconomic. And that's the thing is, is it creates an accountability, which means that if we're all in this together, we mm-hmm. all have to equally care about the funding of this institution. It only makes sense, I, I think. Here, it seems more and more, from what I understand, again, this isn't personal experience because I don't have children, but everybody's fighting to send their kids to these all these private schools because the horror show of, of public K-12 K in most and, of the and, states. And it comes because, in general, the 1% and the economically privileged, the top 20% of society, have the most say in terms of the political makeup of, of policies. And so when it comes to uh, taxation or funding, when you can put your kid into a private school, you basically outsource your obligation to your community. It's, it's, so you're, you're pushing your connections with the community away from social change. It seems to be a, a bit of a quicksand too because the more the quality is leached out, more the resources are leached out of the public sector for education. Mm-hmm. And it's more and more privatized. And you have these private schools, charter, charter schools, schools mm-hmm. and all. Then those c- parents concerned with the quality of their students' education are trying to get into those, and are, and, and, and then and then teachers as well. And then the irony that, that charter whole, schools don't have to be tested like public schools, right? I mean, isn't that part of the irony? Right. But then I'm also just all of the resources that then funnel to that. So teachers as well, like are having the horror of teaching in the public schools where they're not getting the the resources or they go mm-hmm. like because they have smaller classes and then more resources and so they go to the public schools and it's just this quicksand. This is uh, you know, a core to Noam Chomsky's lament about neoliberalism, which is, you know, defund the public, defund the commons. Mm-hmm. And so you blame it on the teachers or the structure or government when it's really a question of funding and priorities. And so it looks like the problem is the government or the teachers but it's actually because you're just not paying yeah, for anything big, anymore. I mean, in big scale. Manufacture here, we'll, failure. Yeah, manufactured failure. Yeah, so what was big scale here is all, majority of the money coming out of the, from the public goes to private hands, military industrial complex, 
contracts and all the rest, private schools and and what have you. And of of course, you just let the let the things that are public fail, mm-hmm. and then, then you can just we would have amazing educational system if we were all in this together. I mean, the, the, my kids go to public school because of my morality. My 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 public and private morality have to meet in public mm-hmm. schools. And I have friends that are Democrats and liberals, and like many uh, university professors, they say they believe in the public good and public universities, but they privately put their kids into private schools. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I met an activist who you know has her had her daughter or son in a private school, but was running for school board. But I'm like, seriously. How can you run for school board if your child's in a private school? Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to want, you have to once again <laughs> right. live your, have your, invest, live your ethics investment in when in, you have in, the choice, right? And having an investment in our collective well being. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're just uh, totally on a driving down a separate highway over here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Our priorities are totally. You know, once again, the answer in America is punishment, separation, and segregation, mm-hmm. and we're seeing this in the educational system. I bet I, you know, and he takes that further into the. You know the fourth country, Slovenia, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I think we're we started with cafeteria food in France. We're moving to moving Finland. Up the sort of educational, oh, yeah, almost the age pattern, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, he looks at the country the called Slovenia and yeah. makes jokes about it being confused with Slovakia, and that the, the they get the mail wrong on on these countries all the time. And you know, this is this is a really another story is once again, American students going to the countries like Slovenia to actually get tuition free education. Mm-hmm. In the film, he talks to a couple of American students that are attending university mm-hmm. in Slovenia and taking courses in English. And he talks about how there's like a hundred at this university, there's a hundred over a hundred courses that are taught in English. And, and as a foreigner, you can go there tuition, tuition mm-hmm. free mm-hmm. because a country let, okay, Americans okay. can't, a okay. country Americans can't even find on the map. Yeah. So let alone, okay, so one, free education, free higher education, but then also to have it to anybody, not just residents who are paying taxes to make it possible, but because we're acknowledging that this is such a priority for mm-hmm. the collective good that you want to have, you want to have access to education and access for diverse groups of people because well, it's it's just better and, for th- and the, 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 everybody. Either the either an administrator at one of the universities or government officials says like we don't create a two tiered system for foreign students because that we want to treat them the way we treat our own our own children in our country, and so the fact that they could easily charge tuition for out of state out of nation uh, students, but that they don't believe in a two tiered system. Yeah, no, but we strongly believe in it over here. So mm-hmm. even the we state, work at, out of state, uh, uh, international. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And over the last decade or so, been real big push to increase enrollment numbers of international students mm-hmm. and out of state mm-hmm. students because of the Pattern. vacuum of mm-hmm. public funding going away. Mm-hmm. Uh, so well, where are we going to get it from? We're we're not charging them enough. It's for it's, it's students. essentially a backdoor privatization. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we can charge twice. We're charging twice as much mm-hmm. for out of state or international students. So let's get more of them because mm-hmm. they're going to pay more money. So and I, what I loved about you know his exploration of Slovenia is like like how profoundly they believe you know, and, and free tuition, free education that, that you can't treat, you know, your teenagers as ATM machines for the future. Right. And so when, when the government was proposing legislation to proposing. create tuition fees, fees, I don't even think it was full on tuition. It was probably a fee. It was, I think it was just a fee. Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's a number of examples, right? And we talked about this in, on the, on the episode about um, the UK election in Corbyn too, right? Because mm-hmm. this was a big, part of the dynamics leading mm-hmm. up to um, what's happening over there right now and, and Corbin's success, right, is the the backlash of students to increasing tuition fees, yeah. right? So the, what, there's a number of examples of different countries well, this where is, this is the university, happening, where people, they fucking go out yeah, in the streets and, and oppose so this in, kind of action. So in 2009, when there was literally a 30% increase in tuition, 20%, I think it was 10% in winter and 20% in spring of 2009 or 10, um, at the depth, the deep depth of the recession in mm-hmm. California as well as the country, the UC system snakily tried to change the term fee into tuition in mm-hmm. terms of the charter for the UC system because obviously it wasn't a fee anymore, it was tuition. Mm-hmm. And so they wanted to change that wording so legally they could just keep moving up these tuition rates. And you know, once again, in, in the U.S., 
because it's such a market mentality, the ad administrators don't really fight the tuition increases at all in any meaningful sense. Well, They're not doing anything. And yet, yeah, administrators don't, and students hardly do. So, yeah. well, you'll see in the US, right? He, he comically put in there, like, this is what happened. It was like a, a little montage. This is what happens in other countries when they propose raising tuition, and it's all of these protests in the street you in know, Europe, mm -hmm. in Europe, throughout Europe, right? But then this is what happens in the US, and it's just like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, students sitting on the lawn doing, you know, acting like nothing's happening. Some of this happening, is... But, mm -hmm. but what we, we do actually see small, my, you know, little pockets, like you and me. Mm -hmm. like, just like you and me here sweating our balls off, <laughs> making this podcast, right, that hardly anybody's going to listen to. Like, there will be a couple... People mm -hmm. will get up and like they'll try to, but there's not a cultural. There's not a critical mass. There's not rarely a critical do mass. we experience critical mass. So in I'll the see. States. I'll see when when we have the tuition hikes as there typically is nearly every year. There's a tuition hike, and there will be a small group of students who will do a little like you know gathering protest in the square, wave. little little protest waving. These are good people, but They're there's doing no the work. But there should there ought to be massive amounts of people rising in numbers, the streets, like rising numbers. Really and, speaking and this out. is. This is hysterical because the U.S. as an image is not only famously an optimistic country, but is supposed to be a non-conformist one. But you oh, can't no. help but think <laughs> that the United States yeah, is one of the robots. most complicit and conformist oh, yeah. cultures I've ever been in. Yeah. I mean, uh, in, in, in Japan, I, I would think, you know, we always say it's conformist, but, but the U.S. Well, this is, yeah, and this is why, like, the, our, the four parts of the Golden Square, the food, shelter, health care, and education, right, aren't. Uh, these are kind of common sense mm -hmm. and there ought to be just common sense, but I think it, it's worth being very explicit about those things. And again and again, talking about them because the cultural idea of those things needs to, mm -hmm. needs to change mm -hmm. radically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once again, I think what's was funny and interesting to me is, is uh, when you saw the student protests occur, it was huge, it was momentous, mm -hmm. and within literally two weeks or three weeks, they were frightened. So yes, and you saw the you saw the uh, anarcho syndicalist flags in the background. Right. So you actually see the level of engagement right. politically. So absolutely, obviously, we're all for that yes. free tuition, free tuition, and like we said before, cradle to grave, cradle to grave, cradle to grave. Uh, this should be considered a human right. So absolutely on this. So then, after college, what happens? Right then, you're into the workforce and. He visits Germany to fifth chapter, to, fifth country. Yeah, he, he visits Germany to to talk to some working class folks who work in a pencil factory, and talk to them about their typical their work environment, did work you, week. Did you think it was important that he looked at a pencil factory? I mean, I think that was uh, so brilliant yeah. conceptually, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like when we think of a pencil factory, we think of China, right? I mean, you think it's something is going to be produced in China for right, really in a, in a horrible window, conditions, in a windowless, windowless warehouse. warehouse. Yeah, yeah. And he asks one of the one of the administrators of the company, one of this management folks, is like, of course you have windows because you don't want people getting sick. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, it's like, oh my God, like, I mean, that's incredible. Like, we, we, we treat humans in the US or in China like, like chickens in a closed off, you know, venue. Right. But that, that literally pencil makers, and they leave at two o'clock from work, 36 hours, 36 hours a week, but they're paid for 40. Yeah. 36 hour work week paid for 40 um, I think the other important parts about around that are what workers the rights and privileges that the workers have have gained uh, in Germany that it talks about is one corporate boards have to be made up of at least half of the board should be and very often workers simple majority right, right. sometimes 51 percent of yeah. the of the corporate board so so that there's a the voice of workers represented. And he, and he cites the fact that there create that creates an accountability for the company. Mm -hmm. So like Volkswagen's whole diesel controversy that they were lying about the numbers, that actually came from workers mm -hmm. who wanted to report their yeah. own company for being full of bullshit. Yeah. The other the other parts here are about respecting the privacy of workers, mm -hmm. respecting the the private realm of their lives and not contacting them, you know, it gives vacation. examples about like Can't not being able to contact Folks when they're on their vacation or in, in companies that block emails from going out to, to folks when they're outside of work hours. I think that's totally something foreign, in my experience at least here in the U.S. and the general narrative of the overworked U.S. worker. Oh, and, and what all, I, what, at all hours of the day, what you're if, responding to if emails. You are, and, if you are clinically depressed, if you're overworked, if you're having psychological issues, your doctor can write you a note 
so you can have a three week vacation at a spa or mental health clinic, which by the way, the mental health clinics are not kind of the cosmic insane asylums. They look like hotels in Germany. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, one of the big, big shocks in Germany was, I think it was the German pilot took down a plane, was suffering from clinical depression and took Mm -hmm. down an entire plane. And uh, they were shocked that he was given a three week vacation, but didn't take it. Mm -hmm. So the German society knew he was suffering and gave him a three week vacation, but he refused to take it. Yeah, the, I think the Germans the, were very upset about that. Yeah, the big the big story here. This part is like res- respecting the well being of employees. <laughs> it's kind of like, yeah. like duh, like this side of a should be a no. And similar man to Italy, right? The similar that good good workers create a good society, great yeah. good products, and that that holistically you look at the well being of people. So. And, you know, once again, this is like worker rights, middle class, you know, the idea that there is a middle class and you don't even have to be, you know, college educated to deserve uh, a decent income. You know, it's pencil makers. And, you know, and then he talks about the way in which, and this is kind of, Germany's a big hodgepodge or big mix of different ideas. He also looks at the way, hodgepodge. Um, you of turn national, that into some other word. Yeah, it's it's my blunderhead. <laughs> it, it's my you kind friend of, Chris would call you, me blunderhead in you college. Kind of, you kind of like... You, you you leave out syllables or or letters mm-hmm. and then you come make up new words all yes. the time here. This is <laughs> in, imp- in, in in the machine gun yes. of the ideas yeah. coming out. Yeah. My my own sketch comedy that nobody watches. <laughs> um and then he, he looks at the notion of cultural memory, national atrocities. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he says, like, okay, given I mean that's why Germany's kind of a messier uh, chapter here because he's dealing with a lot of different concepts, is the third part of this is about the way in which they remember and account for and acknowledge past crimes. The Holocaust. And he talks to an immigrant, and he says that he feels a guilt because this is part of the culture that he lives in, even though he's not genetically, culturally, historically rooted in German society and the Third Reich. He says he feels a responsibility to the legacy of the culture he lives in. And the fact that, you know, that there's reminders of the Holocaust in every, in many parts of Germany with uh, little signs at the the door, remembering the people that yeah, were there. Yeah, fir- firstly, though, was that it talks about is that in every school in Germany, they talk about it with students. They talk yeah. about it, op- like not hiding it, whitewashing it. They talk about what the horrors that happened. And the brilliance of doing that is instead of creating this like celebratory bumper sticker of your nation state, mm-hmm. it says like this is the horror of the nation yeah. state when it's no longer operating with the moral accountability. Yeah, you don't pretend like it didn't happen. Yeah. Or pretend like it's just the thing in the past that you don't need to worry about anymore. And, you know, in Germany, so. in Germany's the country that's taken the most Syrians of any country in the world. Uh, I think over a million. Yeah, it's clear, clearly, 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 in a, in yeah. a sense of of purpose. Yeah. and uh, acknowledgement of past crimes and living a life where you acknowledge those things and b- try to become a better society. Right. And he compares that to like the fact that we don't have museums on slavery. Like there, there is no museum. Didn't have one until 2015. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, well, but what is that? That's the African American museum. I mean, it's, I mean, that's the whole problem is it's, it's part of the African American experience, but it's not a museum about slavery. There's not like a major museum, you know, on that. Yeah, you know, acknowledge your dark side and make amends for it. So that certainly the the idea that that the U.S. could follow these kinds of manners with a museum. So the John J. Cummings had founded this Whitney Plantation Slavery Museum in 2014, and it was you know the first time there wasn't a public account of that. You mm-hmm. know, but yeah. So this is the idea. Uh, this uh, another idea to steal is that to look. Let, let's uh, fess up mm-hmm. to what horrible things have happened in our past. And let's try to make amends for that. And stop apologizing and, and like, denying what yeah. nation states do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The sixth country, sixth chapter. So then yes, uh, Portugal where, uh, drug use is decriminalized. Michael Moore makes a joke. Like I got, if I saw, so if I had heroin, meth, cocaine, I, I would you arrest me right now? And he's like, no. Right. T- well, <laughs> to talk cop, cops. 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 Yeah, yeah. He tells cops, like I got cocaine right now. And they're like, well, so uh, Portugal de- has decriminalized uh, drug use and has seen drug use decline, has been able to do so because of a universal healthcare system that provides treatment for drug users instead of punishment. Yeah, I wish Michael Moore had connected the dots as to why that the rates are lower. And I would mm-hmm. say the rates are lower because not just because they were decriminalized, so everyone just said, oh, it's, I don't, I'm not breaking the law anymore, so I won't do it. It, what it meant is when you decriminalize drugs, 
you can then use that money towards rehabilitation and yes. addiction. Yeah. And so the, the drug rates go down because you're getting people off bad, bad, nasty drugs. Mm-hmm. And I, he doesn't make that as visible, but I had to make that logic leap on my own, which is, of course they go down. It's not just because it's decriminalized. It's because there's actual money that can be used, treated as a mental health crisis, mm-hmm. as a community crisis, where you just stop punishing people mm-hmm. And stop expecting this to be, you know, an individual choice, but actually a metaphor for the sickness of your society, mm-hmm. right? And so he doesn't make that ex- as explicit as he could have. But the idea is, of course, if you decriminalize drugs, then what do you do with the money? Well, you might want to deal with the actual addiction itself mm-hmm. or the society that created from work exhaustion. Yeah, one of the, the most the ha- most heartbreaking parts of the the, the narrative mm-hmm. here is how the war on drugs here mm-hmm. have really been used as he describes in the film here of the war on drugs in the U- United States used as a way to extend slavery and to mm-hmm. a, a really w- a war on black people mm-hmm. and the school to prison pipeline. Yep. Right. And, yep. and, and the, the, the kind of manifestation of slave ships, I saw a beautiful, powerful, a kind of graph of the, of, of, of the plantation a slave ship and the prison and just kind of saying, here we go. There's a, there's something mm-hmm. going on here. And, you know, fundamentally when you reorientate society towards prevention, decriminalization, you, you, you kind of change what you're actually doing, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the focus changes and you can actually orientate towards not punishment based industries, but prevention ones. Mm-hmm. And the, the other part here in Portugal is the lack of a death penalty. Yeah. The cops that are that he talks to um, the cops in feel, Lisbon feel like they're nicer than, than most of the occupational <laughs> people. Yeah, you yeah there's a little clip in there where they make a point of an appeal to the American, their American counterparts of the, the injustice of the death penalty. We should get do away with yeah, that. Yeah, that the, the, the this police officer says, "Can I talk about? Can I talk to the other police enforcers? In America. You guys need to get rid of the death penalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is incredibly shocking and moving, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. A, a actual police officer is horrified. Well, it's just, it's not shocking. It's just a human. But it's, right? it's shocking what's that, shock, it's shocking in the American context of how we view the police, mm-hmm. right? That, the, that this police officer is talking about removing instruments of punishment mm-hmm. from the repertoire of American criminality. Well, right. State and criminality. so then he, 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 he continues on this thread about punishment systems and rehabilitation by going to nor visiting norway Mm -hmm. oh yeah so he goes into the seventh country which is about you know norway and so he he looks at uh that and for norwegians they view kind of almost in the biblical way that you know how you treat the weakest among you and that the treatment of and you can see in various articles in time magazine and others have covered the norwegian prison system as the most humane as well as most expensive system per per inmate and the idea that it's a reflection of your society about how you treat the weakest among you or the most marginalized and that it's not just a commentary about their wanting to have a less crime-ridden society but also Mm -hmm. about the ethics of how humans should be treated so in the film he visits two prisons in norway one that's sort of like an idyllic uh (laughs) island resort where Mm -hmm. the prisoners like have their own apartments and keys to them and sort of Move around freely on. I would this say of of the compound. sections of the sections of the film that were the most profound. I think some of them yeah. were the most shocking because this scene when I've shown this to students or activists and they've seen this part. This is the most riveting part because these the the homes that they're living in are like farm ranches. Or they're mm-hmm. open. There's mm-hmm. no fences. There's no beat downs. There's no scrub downs. There's no inmate raping there's there, well, also some of the facilities look better than dorms like some of my students said this looks better than my dorm oh yeah 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 and because it's the most horrendous and horrific part of our culture in the well, states and, and the, is the it, prison it, system it, it, that we have tv shows about it because it's so drama ridden i oh, mean and we're, it, we're, we're just so like a, orange is the new black and uh z- uh the, the zoo one from hbo i can't remember the title of that do you remember oh like, oz oz yeah and the old one yeah and yeah. so that it's part of the kind of narrative in the u.s the is that the US, this is yeah. the most horrible place to oh, be yeah. and this is how we discipline people and prevent crime mm-hmm. and and some of my students were upset like this is too good you know, they they say this is not this is not right that they're being treated so well, and they were upset in some ways because those prisoners were being treated better mm-hmm. than they were at the university. Yeah, and, oh, and, and, I'm, well, and, and they, well, and they yeah. they get college degrees. I mean, yeah. the 
the I, one of the the um, amazing things is they have like a a music production studio where they can make their yeah, record, albums. A record, record label company. and a studio, a recording and studio. And there's a Time magazine I'll put in the show well, notes. Like probably better conditions than <laughs> we're recording right now. Yeah, our, your recording S- environment. Death, well, yeah. I, I think the, the thing is that, you know, there's a Time magazine article I'll, I'll locate where the, the designers are looking at the building as a form of rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. So like the paint colors. Well, they okay, even I think, think about the paint colors of the room. You, you missed a beat there. Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't let me mm-hmm. frame that enough. He visit first visits an idyllic resort style uh, prison, but then goes to a maximum security prison. What you're talking about is the maximum <laughs> security prison. All mm-hmm. your comments are about this maximum yeah, security you're prison, right, right, right. where ought to be the worst, you know, mm-hmm. the worst in the Norway prison population. And that's the one that has a studio. It has a recording studio. <laughs> and they have they have gym court. They, a beautiful they have basketball a, li- a library. Court. They have washer and dryer. They use not uh, knives. It's you know, and they have their artwork, modern they have, artwork. They have modern artwork in the hallway where the elevator yeah. is. Like you don't even have that kind of art in a, a public school system. It's, it's just like the whole the whole framing and the whole just to illustrate that it's more about rehabilitation than punishment, mm-hmm. and it's borne out in the fact in well, in the statistics. I so, I remember repeatedly crying in one moment of the film. It was the most unexpected and beautiful moment in the film. I think is when you meet uh, one of the, the prisoners at the maximum security facility, mm-hmm. and he has a painting of his prison guard, mm-hmm. who he's friends with. Mm-hmm. He does a painting right. of his prison. Yeah. So he memorializes someone who's already alive okay. as a fucking painting, yeah, yeah. and it's his fucking prison guard. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that made me cry because wow. that, the relationship between the prisoners yeah. and the prison guards are yeah. so profoundly different. And the guards don't have... Weapons uh, don't have guns. You know, that's another part of it. Um, but what I was saying is that, borne out in the statistics, that the Norway has one of the lowest recidivism mm-hmm. rates, so mm-hmm. repeat offending rates, mm-hmm. uh, around twenty percent. Whereas in the states, what we like, we think is the number one, we're the best, and we're just putting locking them all up. Yeah, eighty uh, percent recidivism rate around there that we we're, we're typically well. At you in know, the, states. the one of the notes I made to myself when watching this is that in Norway. Punishment is rebuil- re- rehabilitation. Punishment is rehabilitation. Well, that, 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 that it's, you're punished enough just to try to get to re- rehabilitate well, yourself. Yeah, one of that, the, that is what it is. Yeah, one of the the warden at the more the the less uh, clamped down the first yeah prison, the ranch say, style the ranch yeah, style. the first prison I should say the, he poses the question to him well what is the punishment here if this is so not so great what is the punishment well the punishment is um, removing your freedom like, separation is, separation. Well, the punishment is the lack of mobility. Yes, already. Right? So you talked about this a bunch. You brought this up a bunch when we're talking about healthcare and uh, like the four, the four golden square, the four cornerstones, the golden square. Like, imagine the mobility that it gives you because that's freedom. Freedom mm-hmm. is like the ability to decide where you live. Having the golden square you guarantees you right. that. Typically. So they're still given the necessities, right? They're provided the necessities. But they, you can't go and be with your family, this, and with your friends. This is a kind of that's super, what the punishment is. This is a kind of super powered empathy because they acknowledge that the deep pain of prison life is separation and segregation of loved ones. Mm-hmm. That already is enough of a punishment. Right. That is already devastating. So the fact that they know what the root suffering is is fucking amazing. Like everybody's a philosopher king in Norway when it mm-hmm. comes to prison. So they know that the root stuck structure of the trauma and the pain is not being able to see people that you love mm-hmm. on a regular basis. That is enough punishment for a human being to take. And they don't have, they're not punished by not no longer being able to vote like mm-hmm. uh, ex cons in the States. They, <laughs> prisoners still vote and actually vote first. Yeah, they vote first because the people that you want to bring back into society that need the most, yeah. this is actually strangely similar to Ubuntu culture, right? Like that you first prioritize the people that have done the harm mm-hmm. to try to rehabilitate them the first because they, they need the help the most. They're the most hurt. The people that have committed the hurt are often the people that have been the most hurt. And so that the, the, the politicians actually come to the prisons and like every election will always have a debate and discussion. I mean, Obama was in the news in the last year and a half of his uh, eight-year term in office for being the first president to ever go to a prison. <laughs> first president ever to, to set visit, foot to visit. in a prison yeah, yeah, yeah. or jail, whatever. And so here is 
uh, institutional mm-hmm. arrangement where politicians always show up. Uh, the other, the last part here, uh, uh, maximum sentences in Norway of 21 years. So a couple of the folks were convicted of murder who were on the film, and they were like serving 11-year sentences and stuff. So. Well, I mean, the, the other part of it here. I mean, he interviews, it talks about the most heinous crime since World War II, which is the shooting of uh, progressive socialists. The most heinous crime in Norway. Since yeah, yeah, the most, yeah, the most uh, egregious and horrifying crime was this massive massacre by uh, a lone gunman who went to an island where a lot of young, youthful teenagers that are part of a socialist party um, were actually gunned down on yeah, this island. In 2011. And Michael Moore's interview with the father is just stunning. The father of one of the victims. Yeah. Right. Who didn't wish for... Uh, death penalty. The death penalty. How did you rationalize that? How would you not rationalize that? Well, no, that? no, but, but I'm saying how, how, I'm, I'm, I'm mimicking the kind of American response to that. I'm not saying I... Okay. I can't give you the American response. Well, I, no, I'm, no I, my question is the American response rhetorically, which is, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, is that, you know, why, how can you rationalize it? And his reason why he would never want him to die mm-hmm. is what? Well, he says, that, he says that he wants him to think about his crime every day. And, you know, the fact that this guy doesn't feel guilty for is another reason why he needs to stay in jail for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So he can think about the decision that he made, Mm -hmm. right, for those 21 years. And so if even, and this is someone who was unrepentant, that that literally he asked for a a psychologist from from Japan because that is also extremely historically homogenous country. And so he wanted to understand and have a sympathetic uh, psychologist to examine him as not insane. But the fact that this father, who had his son taken away from him, that he doesn't wish vengeance. Mm-hmm. He wishes a kind of justice through the long-term sentencing. That at some point, this person may discover the, the darkness inside of them and the, and the, the horrible well, mistake and, he made. And that he doesn't have the right to take his life away. Yeah, that it's not the decision of the you know, state to do that. The perpetrator did not have a right to take away those people's lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nor does... The, the father, the family member, the victim have the right to take. Because mm-hmm. life is purpose. too sacred. Yeah. It shouldn't be decided by one person. Yeah. The only person that should decide about that life is the person themselves. Mm-hmm. So spends the time up in Scandinavia and... Yeah. Says, uh, he has, the, he has then, a kind of shadow section where he mm-hmm. says, well, you know, I could go to well, Sweden or Denmark, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to go there. Yeah, so he goes to Tunisia, mm-hmm. uh, northern Africa, and to talk about or to look at... Um, the good ideas there in this Muslim country about women's rights. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and give some shocking statistics about that, right? You want right. to wonder those? So, in uh, since 1973 in Tunisia, uh, abortion has been legal. Tunisia has free government-funded women's health clinics throughout. So that's the the, the main sort of bit that he talks about. At the that we talk about at the beginning there uh, of the section, and then and then talks about. Uh, the women's role in um, the revolution in 2011 in mm-hmm. Tunisia. Central. And then the Islamist government that was formed after mm-hmm. the revolution that was opposed to women's rights, but they weren't having none mm-hmm. of that. And mm-hmm. so the standing up for um, protecting women's rights led to the Islamic the- government stepping down. Mm-hmm. And, and well, vis-a-vis this passage of a new Tunisian constitution, or in Article 46, it literally states, right? Remember the U.S., in the 70s had a movement called the ERA, Equal Rights Amendment Act, mm-hmm. that never got to the point of getting those last three states to ratify this as a new amendment. But it says, Article 46 of the Tunisian Constitution says, the state commits to protect women's achieved rights and develop those rights. The state shall guarantee equality of opportunity between men and women in the bearing of all responsibilities and in all fields. The state shall take necessary measures in order to eradicate violence against women. Mm-hmm. This is a uh, <laughs> Middle Eastern, North African country. So, I mean... That's, a, that's sort of the, supposed to be the irony here mm-hmm. in visiting... Well, and th- they've, had a, a, they've had abortion rights since 1973, too. I mean, mm-hmm. this is like this, th- this idea that there's a manifest determinist outlook on women's rights as a, as a medieval and, one is wrong. And, and, and that it's good for all of us. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's crucial for all of us. Mm-hmm men and women, that women have equal rights to men. That's well, it's the Bakunin expression, Mikhail Bakunin's expression, that my freedom is based off your freedom, mm-hmm. right? That I am not free when you're unfree, yeah. 
right? And this sense of reciprocity. And she notices this kind of connection between a sacrifice, let's say, by the most famous person in the Middle East now, probably, is, uh, is uh, Muhammad Bu Azizi, who, you know, was a grad student, I mean, actually graduated from college, was 26, and was being harassed by corrupt um, police officers for selling fruit. And he lit himself on fire, which led to other um, folks lighting themselves on fire during the Arab Spring. And that Amel Samoud, this radio journalist that she talks to, says she was pregnant and she felt compelled to do something, seeing that someone literally took their life for justice. It started in Tunisia. You know, when one of her uh, fellow journalists' is a brothers de- shot dead, um, she's, and, and, and she says, well, what are you going to do about this? And so decides to go ahead and take a stand. And that cross-connection between sacrifice, not just between women, but also mm-hmm. men, mm-hmm. is important in this journey. And so then ties that to the next uh, location, locale to visit, which is Iceland, to continue this idea about women's equality mm-hmm. and women's rights and the, and the battles for that. And where in Iceland specifically, because it's a place where uh, there have been some minor wins, specifically the 1975 women's strike in Iceland. Oh, that was big. I mean, which I, I didn't find out about this from a Facebook meme. I found out about this, I think, during I think the Occupy mm-hmm. years. It was a three-day strike. 90% of women did not work that day. So by mm-hmm. the third day... The entire economy was about Just to collapse. At a halt. Yeah. Collapse. Yep. Because no was, sex, no work, nothing. But again, this is like because of the mobilization. Right. The mobilization. Mobilization, the notion of direct action, mm-hmm. the sense that of the what you know, Martin Luther King called the emergency of now. So the 1975 women's strike being a precursor to uh, 1980, Iceland electing the first woman president in the world. So single mom. Mm-hmm. Single mom to boot. And so, I mean, and then, and then kind of moves towards the end, towards the mobilization of people led to a prosecution of white collar criminals, right? And, and going after both agents of the right, state right, as, right. Well as, yeah. the, as well as little, derivative little traders. Little jumping quickly there, but like, yeah, quickly the, what connects this to is also like women's role through, throughout Iceland and their representation in companies, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. at least 40% of Company boards need to be made up of at least 40% mm-hmm. women and at least mm-hmm. 40% men. So the equal representation mm-hmm. there. And, and, we, and, and, and be, be running some of the banks. So when the economy of Iceland collapsed in 2008, that you know three banks collapsed, but one did not, and that was the bank that was run by women. Well, And, and there was a study actually that came out after the recession which said that the, the day traders and the trading was largely high testosterone men and that if they were older men or women, there wouldn't have been the kind of mm-hmm. risk taking that would have led mm-hmm. to the collapse. So there isn't a statistical argument to be made about uh, the matrix of gender and diversity. But they've since the Icelandic economy has since recovered, in large uh, part thanks to them actually mm-hmm. prosecuting mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, bankers, so the mm-hmm. and hedge fund managers. So around seventy bankers and hedge fund managers that were a- actually prosecuted for their mm-hmm. crimes and uh, sent to prison. So. What do you think about the ending with it? This ending with the Berlin Wall. Did you think that was a good appeal? Well, it's sort of to use as so yeah. So the film wraps up with them visiting the Berlin Wall to sort of use as a metaphor of the the system seems to be like there forever. I think mm-hmm. it's going to be there forever, but then she ham- hammer. What does he, he uses his little? Well, the, <laughs> the story is just one person was hammering, and then it became other people. Right? Is that this one person had the naked courage to start hammering at the this wall, and then it became a tsunami. Right. Well, and he and he uses his little friend, hammer chisel down, right? Mm-hmm. Like the mm-hmm. hammer at it, and eventually it'll like make a hole, and then it'll be down. This mm-hmm. thing that you thought mm-hmm. was uh, impenetrable, like the Berlin Wall, like can be changed. It's it's like this uh, beautiful quote from um, Nina Turner in her speech uh, to the activists for SB five sixty two for single payer in California. She said, "Whenever you feel like you're in a tomb." Imagine that you're in a womb, right? That, mm-hmm. that, 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 that you're not trapped in death, that you're actually, that this feeling of death is actually a, a site of birth. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, wraps up by reframing all of these ideas, this whole list, a big long list of social democratic ideas as noting that, hey, these actually aren't original ideas or new ideas. Most of these, you know, originated in the States. That mm-hmm. These are really, uh, to a large degree, uh, come from the the U.S. It's a fantastic wrap up because he holds all that information back until the end. So he talks about well, the Finnish educational model 
looked at the experimental radical notions of education in the 60s, when America was really experimenting with anti-authoritarian, decentralized, uh, student-centered classrooms. That came from America in the 60s. So on the whole, we take this collection of ideas that has taken us now quite a long time to get through. <laughs> Uh, it's a lot of ideas. <laughs> it's a lot of ideas. It's a lot of ideas. Uh, but we, we we take this collection of ideas. We bring them. We bring them to the states. What's your take? These good ideas. These worth pursuing. Implementing. These these ideas are the starting point for anything beyond. I mean, mm-hmm. that we should already be here in the U.S. on these issues. Right. Um, uh, and stop talking about the next Democratic or Republican election cycle. But say, what policies are our vision? You know, what are our values? Mm-hmm. And don't think in terms of electoral strategy or party politics. Look for people that are going to deliver these policies, and whether it's on a mu- municipal level or on a national state level. Yeah, I, I think on the whole, these are sensible... Strategic statist solutions. Strategic, yeah, yeah. None, of, none of which, like, uh, again, the example of the manager from the Ducati plant, this isn't in contradiction to making money yeah you know, any of these things mm-hmm. like these these are these are simple social welfare mm-hmm. ideas mm-hmm. that obviously we don't have here in the states mm-hmm. or and, we only have limited and, limited amount uh, limited measure of these and these are but, in states that have capitalism as an mm-hmm. entrenched part of its yes. economic reality so i mean this is the starting point towards utopia, right? But, but, as, but no, certainly not yeah. something we'd want to end up with. Yeah, but as utopians, as as someone who would be on the anarchist perspective, mm-hmm. I'm not going to turn my nose at these, even just yeah. because they're 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 not all the way there. The to doctrinaire utopia. anarchists that would say, "Well, this is the state," I would say, remind them once again that states come in different size cages. Yeah, we've got to widen the gaps that, in the Make cage that cage here. big enough yes. so so the little rabbit can put the fucking key in and take a nice rabbit shit out of the rabbit cage. Yeah. Right? So we can make the cage large enough that we can get the key in to the door <laughs> and so the little, uh, so you, the little happy rabbit, can take a beautiful shit in the grass <laughs> instead of smelling your shit in the fucking cage. <laughs> right? So you are the fucking rabbit Make the cage larger so we can take a shit together in the grass. That is okay. the end. Okay. Let's shit together in the grass. Happy Easter. Let's fertilize. <laughs> so your duty, yeah. little rabbit, your duty is to join me so we can shit together with sovereignty. <laughs> How do you feel, Good. little rabbit? Good. Uh, this is too hot in here. We need to wrap up. <laughs> So, it's getting hot in here. Okay, we're om- we're almost there. And uh, to take us out, we've got an outro. Hi, I'm Ross Blotcher, and my hope is for a future that is driven by choice and not upheaval. I'm hoping that we can get to our desired future without having to do things antithetical to that future on the path there, and uh, hopefully do an end run around human stupidity and greed. But my future has more reproductive choice, fewer humans, but better cared for humans, more education, more renewable energy, and technological advances that benefit everyone. In my ideal future, we'll be active in the world because we're following our passions, not because we're just trying to survive. So, thank you, Ooh. Ross. Ross is Ross is an uh, organizer of a book club here in L.A., associated with the Center for Inquiry called the Skeptics Book Club. Mm-hmm. That meets monthly. We'll leave a Solid. link to that Facebook group if anybody in L.A. wants to join I like that, I like his uh, very good. choice and upheaval. You yeah. know, that, that, that binary is really helpful. I, I, there were a lot of those things. Uh, not all of those were discussed in, in this episode. Uh, there wasn't much on technology mm-hmm. and population problem and but let's, hey let's, this is what we appreciate this door this. Oh, widening into this cage is going to help us get we there we appreciate it because this is the first person that's gone on oh, to yes. our website thank you gone on to our website and told us what they want the yes. future to be so if you want to be that person you want to step up and want to make a choice instead of relying on upheaval come to our website <laughs> and tell us what you think the future is tell me that you also want to be a rabbit that shits outside the cage there you go there's mm-hmm. a that's Shit with me and Jesse out on the grass. Yes. Uh, thanks so much. We can, we can make more flowers and less weeds if our rabbit asses are shitting on that grass. So uh, make more flowers, less weeds. Go to thefutureismixtape.com. Email us at thefutureismixtape at gmail.com. 
get onto the Facebook if you are if, if you do well, if, you if you're already if on, you're maybe don't I don't encourage this yeah. but if you're already on the Facebook go to slash the future is a mixtape if you're on the Twitter you can tweet That's it called us. self sabotage. I don't encourage this, but please do anyways. Well, I, this is a, it's not for you, but you know, I'm, we all have different ways of digitally expressing ourselves. Well, with our digits. No, I, all I'm saying is, given the warning that you yeah. so harshly mm. insist upon about, like, don't go mm. be distracted. The, mm. uh, what is your terminology? Is the there? the entertainment distraction complex. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So EDM as part of this. You're, 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 that's my little you, axe to grind. Yes, your yeah. little, that's my celebrity thing. Yeah, you've got the, fa- you're like all in the Facebook mm-hmm. tunnel there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're on Facebook, uh, Twitter. This is, there's an Instagram account, uh, for what it's worth. There's a tw- Twitter account at Future Mix. Is Tapes. Anthony Weiner on our, our Instagram? Because we can no, get some photos no, from him. I don't, you're obsessed with Anthony Weiner. He's not, has nothing I, to do with this. How many content. times have I mentioned it? A couple it. times. Twice. Yeah. That's, we're like fucking that, 10 episodes that in. That counts for, uh, counts yeah. towards obsession. We'll make a poem out of it. You string that's it together. 20, 20%. Uh, and uh, 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 what else am I forgetting? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, oh, we, we should we should announce that we'll be, you know, coming in and around and, and doing more things and we hope to interview uh uh, more folks on different topics and start moving towards uh, people that are doing solutions right now. I'll look at actual solutions and make this podcast about the future for the future. Thanks for listening. Tell other folks about it. Pass it on. Expand our market Expand beyond these seven the people from Thailand. Expand the cage. Mm-hmm. So Let's shit together. Yes. Eat together, shit together, grow flowers together. All right. Till next time. Cheers. Cheers.